Uh, I did a couple articles. One of them was about uh, the economic side of this and how basically uh, the deep state is using this crisis and, and weaponizing this crisis to destroy our economy, to uh, loot the American public on a massive scale. I mean, this is unprecedented. This is crazier than what they were doing in 2008, printing trillions of dollars and buying up assets. I mean, we're seeing that all over again times 10. Um, and then they're rolling out all kinds of like technocratic, tyrannical tools. You know, they're pushing uh, biometric digital IDs for everyone. They want mandatory vaccines for everyone. And I've come to the conclusion that uh, the establishment has been planning and preparing for something like this for at least a decade, maybe more. And why do I think that? Well, because we have a lot of documentation to suggest that, including a Rockefeller Foundation report that came out in 2010 Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcade Economics. And today, a show I'm really excited about because as you can see over to the other side there is my friend Alex Newman, foreign correspondent for The New American. Um, kind of like the antidote to CNN is how I think of it and goes to a lot of these events and meetings where we hear about is there going to be a currency reset or what's the World Bank doing or all these Bohemian Grove and otherwise fascinating things that we often don't hear about but fortunately fortunately Alex keeps an eye on maybe we'll get his thoughts I know you're piped into the whole election circus um, a lot of things to cover today so Alex it's great to have you here thanks so much for joining me how are you I'm doing great. It's great to be with you, Chris. Thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be with you again. I love what you do. So thank you very much. Well, I'm darn excited. Uh, we, we had to stop talking about stuff and hit the record button because there's <laughs> so much going on. Uh, but first to dig into something I know is on everybody's mind is the coronavirus. Um, and maybe I'll issue a disclaimer up front. I'm gonna try and say everything respectfully here because I do believe there are people being affected by this. Although some of my comments and questions to you, Alex, are more about the government response where it's just a lot of it feels pre-planned. And as someone who was uh, actually running from the dust cloud in September 11th and, and had a hard time seeing that for what it was for a long time, then there, there's just a lot that reminds me of that. Um, so anyway, uh, let me stop talking and take it away. Any thoughts you have, and I'll probably have some questions. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you, Chris, for the opportunity to talk about this. We actually just did a, um, <clears throat> we did a, um, special issue in the new American magazine dealing uh, entirely with the coronavirus. So the only topic of the magazine, uh, the special issue we just did was coronavirus. Uh, I did a couple articles. One of them was about uh, the economic side of this and how basically uh, the deep state is using this crisis and, and weaponizing this crisis to destroy our economy, to uh, loot the American public on a massive scale. I mean, this is unprecedented. This is crazier than what they were doing in 2008, printing trillions of dollars and buying up assets. I mean, we're seeing that all over again times 10. Um, and then they're rolling out all kinds of like technocratic, tyrannical tools. You know, they're pushing uh, biometric digital IDs for everyone. They want mandatory vaccines for everyone. And I've come to the conclusion that uh, the establishment has been planning and preparing for something like this for at least a decade, maybe more. And why do I think that? Well, because we have a lot of documentation to suggest that, including a Rockefeller Foundation report that came out in 2010. Uh, it, you know, very bland title. It's called... Um, the future of technology and international development, you know, another one of those reports that nobody ever reads except the elitists who know that there's bombshells buried inside there. And they talk about, you know, we got to integrate the whole world and they're talking about really building the new world order. And they outline four different scenarios to move us in that direction. And one of the scenarios called lockdown, I mean, you can pick up a copy of this report and you read it and it's like you're reading the news. <laughs> it's, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, it is almost like a, an exact description of what is going on right now in terms it's like of they're, they're 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 reading a script exactly and 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 all these players seem to already know you know what's coming what's going to go on what's going to happen uh it, it really very much looks like they're reading a script and um you know i i'm as you said there's certainly people who have been affected by this there's a lot of people who've been uh affected economically by this 
what is it, 22 million people have lost their jobs already. Uh, thousands, maybe more small businesses shut down forever. Thousands of restaurants that are never going to reopen again. Uh, massive amounts of value wiped off the stock market. And of course, the Federal Reserve coming in and, uh, and buying up everything, municipal bonds, corporate bonds, equities. I mean, you, you name it, they're buying it with funny money that they created out of nothing. This is total craziness, Chris. It, it, it is insane. the American people. It is. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's happened so quickly, people haven't really been able to grasp it because it's like you had all of the chaos of 2007 and 2008 packed into four to six weeks. And I would... I feel as if many people in the financial world have not even grasped that the Fed is now printing unlimited. I mean, because we just see the headlines happen so quickly, like small business loans, money market funds, we'll tack that on. Um, of course, I'm guessing we probably have no idea what is the real amount that's being printed. Um, but along, uh, along the lines of uh, Corona, perhaps a question, or actually first, do you have any thought on how serious this is? I've heard reports all the way ranging from, you know, we're misdiagnosing the flu to it's a bioterror weapon. Um, and then I've heard some people who seem very educated medically. Uh, one, uh, there's a doctor named Paul Cottrell. He thought it could potentially kill 150 million Americans. And the guy seemed like a genius. So I've heard a whole wide range. I do think there's something that people are being affected by. And again, we're, we're separating that from the government response. But, but, but from what you've heard and seen, do you have any thoughts on what we're actually dealing with? Yeah, thank you, Chris. And, and I'll start off with the, with the mandatory disclaimer that I'm not a doctor. I'm not a virologist. Don't come to me for medical advice, viewers, because <laughs> uh, I can't give you any. But what I can say is I'm a journalist, and, and I have talked to a lot of medical doctors. In fact, that's really what journalists do is you reach out to people who are, who are actually experts in this field, and you try to figure out uh, you know, where the truth lies. And I'll tell you, Chris, I, I've talked to a lot of people, and I've had a, like you, I've had a very broad range of, um, of theories and, and um, levels of seriousness. So uh, actually later today, I'll be talking with a, a, a medical doctor who's advising the White House, who has been advising the White House. In fact, uh, she was talking about hydroxychloroquine uh, two weeks before the White House was officially promoting hydroxychloroquine as, uh, as a possible uh, treatment for this. And, you know, it's, again, it's hard to know how serious it is. What I will say is I've talked to a lot of doctors and medical professionals who've looked at the numbers, who've looked at the data and said, this is not nearly as serious as we're being told. Um, They've said that, uh, you know, at, at best, this will kill, you know, some tens of thousands of people. It does seem to me, and we just talked recently with uh, Dr. Shiva Ayaduri, who's a uh, MIT scientist. He's a biological engineer who actually specializes in this kind of stuff. He's got four degrees from MIT. And... Um, I encourage people to go watch that. Uh, it's, it was an hour-long interview. Uh, Facebook slapped it with a uh, independent fact checker rating that was false, and later they backed down. Actually, we we up we had uh, updated that, and we showed that they were wrong. And uh, what he says is uh, there are a lot of people who are being uh, you know who are supposedly dying from coronavirus who are not actually dying from coronavirus. You can't trust the numbers uh, from either the U.S. government or the World Health Organization, certainly the Communist Chinese Party. Um, but with all that said, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's nearly as serious health-wise as we're being told it is. Yeah, people are going to die. People, I mean, what is it, half a million people die every year from cigarettes, right? I mean, it, you know, people die. People die from car crashes. People die from the flu. Uh, something like 60,000 died from the flu a couple of years ago. So yeah, people die all the time. A lot of these are people who have their immune systems compromised, people who are already very, very unhealthy, already very close to death, and maybe they catch coronavirus, and maybe it pushes them over the edge. Maybe they were going to die anyway. It's all being counted as coronavirus deaths. But with all that said, um, I do think there's a very real possibility that this is a bioweapon. Um, and, and I've said this from the very beginning. Uh, you know, communist China is extremely dangerous. Uh, they had a lot going on there. You know, the Hong Kong uprising, that was starting to spread to mainland China. The economy was in big trouble because Trump was finally, after all these decades of globalist American presidents helping to build up communist China, Trump was finally trying to step in and say, enough of this, right? We're not gonna build up a hostile mass murdering foreign dictatorship. We're at least gonna get some fairness in this relationship. Uh, that was gonna be catastrophic for them. Plus, 
you know, and, and this is an angle that a lot of people, uh, even in the truth movement, the liberty movement, don't don't necessarily understand. I think it's unfortunate because I don't think you can understand geopolitics until you understand this, is that the mass murdering dictatorship in communist China is literally in bed with the globalist elites of the West. I'm talking Henry Kissinger. I'm talking David Rockefeller. I'm talking Bill Clinton. I'm talking Council on Foreign Relations, Bilderberg. Right, all these globalist groups, going all the way back to the very beginning. I mean, after World War II, subversives within the Council on Foreign Relations made sure that Communist Chairman uh, Mao would end up taking over China. Uh, and then from then on, they worked to build him up. David Rockefeller went over there in the early 70s with Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger basically laid out the plan. Hey, we're going to make you guys into a superpower. Uh, I just saw Steve Bannon recently say that um, Henry Kissinger was taking Communist Chinese money all this time, that he was a traitor and that he was going to be arrested. So uh, I hope that will come to pass. But you can't understand what's going on in the world with the coronavirus or anything else unless you understand that communist China is uh, basically a product of the deep state in London, New York, Washington, D.C., and so on. And so I think there's a very real chance that this uh, virus was created or cultivated in this uh, Wuhan military laboratory. And then, you know, it's possible it leaked out accidentally. I'm leaning much more in the direction of deliberately released. Uh, whether we'll ever know for sure, it's hard to know. You know, it's like with a lot of those things, who really killed JFK? I have no idea. Obviously, somebody did. Obviously, it was a conspiracy, as Congress concluded in its investigation. But who was involved in the conspiracy? Maybe we'll never know. But we can look at all these different data points. We can look at all this evidence and come to what I think are some reasonable conclusions. And I think it is a very reasonable conclusion that uh, the communist Chinese released this and that the globalists, at the very least, the deep state is exploiting this to advance the agenda that they've had in place for decades. Alex, it's a, a great point. I really appreciate you mention there because it raises something that I've felt and not known how to put into words in the sense that, you know, on TV, we're given, you know, Putin, Trump, Xi Jinping, and, you know, they're all enemies and want to kill each other. And, but kind of along the lines of what you said, I've wondered before, I'm like, what if that's just the distraction and it's really maybe the same banks that own, you know, some of these countries. And I mean, how do we know how much of this is real? And it sounds like you're saying that it could essentially be connected like that in a sense. Absolutely. No question about it, Chris. And, and the amazing thing is now all the propaganda media, all the deep state media, CNN and other sources of fake news, they're saying, oh, it's Trump's fault that uh, the UN is falling under the control of communist China. What a bunch of baloney. Okay? We've, we've been exposing this for decades at the New American Magazine. And if people really want to get the facts about you know, the deep state's relationship with communist China, um, I, I wrote a concise cover story article for the New American Magazine uh, back in, I think, 2016. Uh, it might have even been 2015 called, and you can look this up in any search engine. I encourage you to read it. It's a short read. It's called China, colon, staking claim in the new world order. And what you'll see is that from the very beginning of this mass murdering dictatorship all the way up to the present day, right? Just a few years ago, George Soros was saying communist China should own the new world order. He said communist China has a better functioning government than the United States. This is the same view that uh, tyrants like Michael Bloomberg have, right? The elites openly talk about this. Go to the World Economic Forum in 2017. Xi Jinping gave the keynote speech, and it was all about how he was going to save the new world order from this crazy maniac Donald Trump. And all the globalists were bowing down at his feet and kissing his ring. And, oh, Xi Jinping, the savior of the new world order from this lunatic American who wants to blow it all up. Um, you know, you can't understand what's going on until you understand that communist China and the globalist deep state in the United States are working together, have been working together. And... Really, if you want to understand the broader context, communist China is like the Petri dish. It's like the, the laboratory. And if you want to know what the new world order will eventually look like, um, communist China is the model. Technocratic, totalitarian, but they want to you know, reduce the level of absolute terror and savage barbarism to control people and move more toward the model that the Chinese are moving toward now. Uh, the social credit system where you kind of just control yourself and you behave. And it's interesting to, to just kind of bring this back to the coronavirus, Chris. If you go look up this uh, Rockefeller Foundation document that I mentioned at the beginning of this segment, um, it, it, they have a scenario in there called lockstep, which I mentioned. And it focuses a lot on communist China. And it paints communist China as the success story. They, they talk about how communist China used this ruthless response, you know, sealed off everything, just 
total tyranny to enforce the, you know, the so-called quarantine. And this is not a quarantine. They're not quarantining sick people. They're locking everybody in their houses. Um, when you see that communist China comes out looking like the hero in all this, you realize, wow, there is a lot going on here that we're not being told. Joe Biden is in bed with communist China. CNN is in bed with communist China. You know, the founder of CNN, Ted Turner, this is a guy who, who's obsessed with reducing the number of people on the planet. They love communist China's population control system with forced abortions. And, and you know, my wife actually asked me this when we were talking about it, but would, would China really kill its own people by releasing a virus? Like, oh my goodness, they've killed 100 million of their own people. They don't care. They love killing their own people. They think they have too many. That's why they've been forced for decades now, this barbaric uh, population control regime where they will literally strap a pregnant woman down to a table at nine months and butcher her child as the child is on the way out. Um, of course, they'll kill their own people, and the globalists love it too. In fact, I, you know, one more thing on this: David Rockefeller. He wrote a column in the New York Times, an op-ed, and it's still published at the New York Times website. You can go read it yourself. It's called uh, "From a China Traveler." He had gone over to China in the early 1970s, back when it was closed to Westerners. Why do mega bankers get to go, and leaders of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Bilderberg? Somebody should ask. Go read this column. He talks about uh, the so-called social experiment under Chairman Mao in China as being the most important and successful in all of human history. And yeah, 60 million, 80 million people were butchered. Hey, that's, you know, that's success if you're, uh, if you're insane, right? Uh, so that's what's going on here, I think, Chris. And, and I think China is the crucial piece of the puzzle, puzzle that so many people in the West are missing. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. And I can also understand at the same time that it's hard for a lot of people to grasp because of the way we've grown up here in the U.S. and what we thought our government was. Although I often just think back to the weapons of mass destruction that not only did Saddam Hussein not have, but there's evidence that the Bush gang, they knew darn well that they didn't have it. They lied and they went. And so, I mean, it, which is which is tragic and and but I think points out that yes, this is all, a lot of these governments are doing these horrific things. Um, one last question about Corona before we move on to some of the financials, which I'm excited to dig into. Although you mentioned how a lot of things seem planned. And I remember how from September 11th, we know that NORAD had been doing simulations of a plane flying into a building for months, including even on the morning of September 11th, also what i wonder how many people are aware of i know folks like you and i are have known for a long time but the bush family and the bin laden's business partners i believe the elder george bush was wasn't he with uh bin laden his father or one of their family members on the morning of that so again what that why it triggered some of the things that are happening now because We've heard of Event 201, which is basically Bill Gates, World Health Organization, and Johns Hopkins, of all the things to do on a Saturday afternoon in New York, last October 18th, I believe, they were doing a simulation of not what would happen if there was a virus, or if there was a pandemic, or if there was a terrorist attack, but whole panel of discussion, who knows how much money was spent to study what would happen if there was a coronavirus, I mean, they even made mock videos. It's like a pretend, you know, they have actors playing like, well, the economy crashed today, like simulating it out. And I mean, I know you mentioned it looks like a script before. I watched this movie Contagion from 2011. Even the words that are being used are the same. So again, long question, but just any thoughts on how a lot of this stuff I do believe is coded sometimes. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's going on. And when you look at the players involved in this event 201 and you look at the scenario they dreamed up and you look at the responses they proposed, again, it, it, it's like the script was already written, right? Well, oh my goodness, there's an outbreak. What do we do? Okay, well, we got to censor the media to prevent misinformation. We've got to shut down and control social media so that we don't get misinformation out there. We've got to lock down the population. We've got to shut down the economy. We've got to force vaccinate everybody on Earth. We've got to put the World Health Organization in charge of the global response, all of which we're seeing right now. And, you know, the World Health Organization component brings me right back to communist China again. 
Um, before the current Marxist head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, who's not a medical doctor, he's actually uh, a communist terrorist. He was on the Politburo of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, which is, of course, a communist terrorist organization. Uh, it was called a communist terrorist organization by our own U.S. government. It was officially designated a terrorist group. It was a genocidal terrorist group that wanted to eliminate the Amhara people. And so when Tedros was serving as the right-hand man of the brutal Marxist mass murdering dictator of Ethiopia, he helped advance that cause. Uh, and so communist China rewarded him for his uh, brutality and his savagery with a spot running the World Health Organization. And there he has served as communist China's poodle. And before Tedros took over the World Health Organization, it was actually run by an agent of the communist Chinese party, Margaret Chan. And so World Health Organization, Bill Gates is actually one of the largest donors to the World Health Organization, even bigger than governments, actually. Um, you know, Bill Gates functionally owns the World Health Organization in partnership with Communist China. And of course, Bill Gates is deeply in bed with Communist China as well. He was actually inducted into the National uh, Communist Chinese National Academy of Engineering, a very prestigious group of uh, so-called engineers and, uh, and experts. So when you bring this all together, you see that all of these people, Bill Gates, the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, Johns Hopkins, and a lot of these other partners that were brought in for this event 201, uh, have been planning for something exactly like we're seeing um, for a long time. And if you're not suspicious about that, it's because you're not paying attention. And again, Bill Gates is one of those guys where we don't even have to speculate. This guy will openly tell you to your face, he thinks there's way too many of us on the planet. Um, you can go on YouTube, you can see a video of him talking about there's way too many people, there's gonna be 9 billion people, but hey, if we do a really good job with vaccines and healthcare, uh, maybe we can reduce that number by 10 or 15%. You're thinking, wait a minute, I thought vaccines and, and healthcare were supposed to help us live longer. Here you are talking about them as tools to depopulate the planet in public, okay? So um, do they do they slip a microchip in that vaccine? Was just when I was reading all this stuff, it was really, it, it's, it's disturbing. It is, Chris. And, and that's one of the things that I covered in, um, in my article on the deep state uh, economic takeover in that special report that we did in the New American that I mentioned. Uh, Bill Gates and the Rockefeller Foundation and some other you know, globalist billionaires, including the Kochs, by the way. A lot of people think the Kochs are you know, hardcore libertarians or conservatives. In some ways they are, but in some ways they're involved in some very nasty things. And they helped finance uh, this program, this research at MIT, along with Bill Gates and others, where they were coming up with uh, nanotechnology that would be implanted under the skin. Uh, and you can read all this. They actually put out a press release over at MIT and they talk about these nanoparticles are going to be basically like a little tattoo under your skin that could be read by a smartphone to determine whether you've had all your vaccinations, your medical history. And I don't know if you saw, but Bill Gates said, we're never going to get back to normal until everybody on the planet is vaccinated. So that's their plan. They fully intend to create a global system, uh, not only for vaccinating, but also for keeping track of who has been vaccinated. Then you look at what the World Health Organization has been doing on this front, what Bill Gates has been doing on this front. Uh, I wrote an article at The New American a few years ago, Chris, where the uh, World Health Organization and UNICEF, and in partnership with Bill Gates, they were doing a tetanus vaccination campaign in Kenya. Well, the Kenyan Doctors Association, the Catholic Kenyan Doctors Association got suspicious. They grabbed a bunch of these vaccines from different parts of the country, sent them to laboratories all over the world. They found out that every single one, Chris, was laced with a hormone called, uh, I think, HCG or HGC. I can't remember which one. And um, this hormone is crucial for women to be able to carry a pregnancy to term. And so what was happening when they'd get these vaccines is the body would develop an immunological response to this hormone as if it were an invader, a hostile thing that needed to be attacked by the immune system. So these women then were sterilized permanently as a result of these vaccination campaigns. So uh, these people are up to some really dangerous stuff. Um, they're weaponizing this crisis to, to take down our economy and to take our freedoms, and they need to be exposed, Chris. Well, Alex, it's, it's certainly unfortunate, but I do appreciate, because uh, I know it's a, a tricky position. I know you have a positive intention, and it's, it's something I often wonder. It's not like I'm sitting here want to beat up the J.P. Morgan pinata every day, but you know, you see some of the unfortunate things that are happening. So I appreciate you standing up for that. Uh, speaking of JP Morgan and our glorious economy. So that is part one of my interview with Alex Newman. Again, some really fascinating things that he shared there. 
And in part two, we turn towards how this is impacting the financial markets. You're definitely going to want to hear that. So hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. So that way you're posted when that comes your way. And with that said, I will see you tomorrow night.